First person shooters have been a thing going all the way back to 1992, a short year after I was born, with Wolfenstein 3D for the PC. But the genre wouldn't really properly explode until the release of one of the most metal games of all time, Doom. With these titles, it had done something rare in the games industry, they had made a whole new genre of their own. And this genre would of course later find even more success with the advent of online multiplayer military shooters like Call of Duty, Medal of Honor and Battlefield selling millions and millions of copies. Now this is usually the part of the video where I'll tell you about my history and love of the genre of the game series I'm about to be talking about. But not today. And that's because I've never really been a big fan of first person shooters and I boil this down to a couple of factors. Most of the early FPS games when I was growing up were on PCs and I was a poor dumb kid back then and I didn't even have one until I was older. So most of the FPS games I was exposed to growing up were vastly gimped versions of these PC games on my peasant consoles. A lot of the early shooters I was playing were on the N64 and we all know how well they work on this abomination of a controller. Seriously, try going back to any FPS game that was on the N64 now and see if you still come back to me and say it was amazing and peak gaming. I am experiencing physical pain. This is, this is agony. But later on in life I did use my older brother's PC to finally try out some FPS games as God intended them to be played with a mouse and keyboard. However, there was another road bump in me enjoying FPS because I'm left-handed and playing any PC game left-handed in the early 2000s was a labyrinthian nightmare. And for the large majority of you that are normal and don't use a mouse in your left hand like I do, you'll be like, what's the big deal? Just remap the controls. Well, if you're using a mouse on the left like I am, your hands always end up too close together and I type with my left hand as well, so it just feels awkward. But that's enough ranting about the foibles of being a lefty. The leftorium is no morium. So these two things meant most of the games in this genre passed me by. Apart from Torok 2. But that's mainly because it had monsters in it. And when we moved into the sixth generation of games consoles, that's when I started getting into shooters slowly but surely. Playing them with the two thumbstick layout was a lot more manageable than playing them on this joke of a controller. I ended up really loving the Halo series, which was so much fun to play in split-screen multiplayer with my friends. However, most other shooters just didn't really grab me because the in-vogue thing at the time was dull-looking military FPS games. These games just didn't appeal to me because I really like things that have a sense of humour and a fine style to them, and most of these games didn't have that. But then enter Time Splitters 2, the first FPS game I got truly addicted to and constantly replayed alone and with friends. It had everything Teenage Me was looking for, it had the multiplayer fun that I love from Halo mixed with a very British sense of humour. And of course, lots of monsters, zombies and robots. There is something I must tell you. I came... I must have spent hundreds of hours playing this game in multiplayer with my childhood friends in split screen. I really do miss just sitting down on the couch to do some gaming with your bros. Shameless is a rare thing in games these days. And later on, Time Splitters 2 got a sequel, Time Splitters Future Perfect, that I got equally obsessed with. And for me, it just surpassed the second game in many ways with a cinematic story that felt like a quirky early 2000s sci-fi comedy movie. And of course, the sheer amount of crazy stuff you could play as in this one appealed to me as well when it came to the multiplayer deathmatches. Then, as quickly as it came, the series disappeared into the inky black darkness of time like that one-hit wonder guy, Snow, who did Informer. What happened to the series and the company who made it? Let's start there, like you don't already know all this before you clicked on the video, and like I'm not just reading this off Wikipedia. You know I know nothing about video games, and I found what you just said riveting. The video game market in the early days in the UK was very different to the landscapes you would see in America or many other places in the world. Contrary to common belief, stuff like the NES wasn't really that popular in the 80s over here, we were a land ruled by what were called microcomputers. And the big dog of this market here was the ZX Spectrum that compared to the colourful cartoony graphics of the NES and Master System was quite primitive. But this in many ways was to the little computer that could's advantage because it was easy to develop games for and it was a lot cheaper than the expensive NES and Master System games. This led to scores of bedroom programmers putting out games and selling them to game publishers who would get them in stores. And the fact that these games came on cassette tapes meant they were very easy to churn out to shops. They were so reasonably priced that they would often find their ways into smaller corner shops for kiddies to spend their pocket money on. And it was in this environment that the company that would be the precursor to Free Radical and Rare Ultimate Play the Game would cut its teeth, making many successful games for the Spectrum like Jetpack and Saber Wolf, but it wasn't long before they wanted more. The ZX Spectrum market was basically only in the UK and Ultimate wanted to get into the more lucrative and upcoming games console market. This is when the folks at Ultimate would sell up the Ultimate brand and establish Rare and set up about reverse engineering stuff for the NES. And their work impressed Nintendo so much that they offered them an unlimited budget to work on games for them. They went on for a while producing lots of stuff for the NES, but it was in the SNES era when they started to truly pick up steam. The Donkey Kong Country trilogy and Killer Instinct really cemented them as among the top dogs of developers for Nintendo. But with the advent of the N64 era, this is when Rare would go mental and produce a giant string of acclaimed bangers. Let's kick this in the dick! 
I don't really need to list everything here, but you probably already know they smashed it out of the park with all their 3D platformers at the time. And of course, one of the best kart racers of all time, Diddy Kong Racing, showing their infinite flexibility. But the game most important for the purposes of this video is of course when the group of talented lads turned their hands to the FPS genre which resulted in probably one of the best licensed games of all time, GoldenEye, which basically invented split-screen multiplayer FPS deathmatches. And with this success under their belts, they did it again with Perfect Dark, making another FPS banger, proving GoldenEye wasn't just a fluke. It was at this point, long-time employee David Doak, better known as Dr. Doak from GoldenEye, left the company. And this led to a cascade of important people joining him and leaving Rare with the goal of making more games like GoldenEye and Perfect Dark together. Because behind the scenes, they were feeling like they were doing all of the work on these games and barely getting any of the profit. So they thought, why don't we just go off on our own and make the games ourselves so we can get the fat stacks. I'm gonna go build my own theme park with blackjack and hookers. And the boys first started by pitching a game called Redemption to Idos, which would later become Second Sight. Another game I really need to cover at some point. But the team had their sights set on doing something else first, making a quick first-person shooter for the soon-to-be-released PS2. Which luckily for Free Radical had missed its release date multiple times, which gave them enough time to slap together a game for it. They saw a gap in the market because they knew no one else would have the expertise to knock out a mostly multiplayer FPS in time for the PS2 launch window. Knowing this would be a great idea, they went to IDOS saying they'd rather do this idea than Redemption. And this is how the meeting went. So we kind of went to IDOS and said we'd like to do that instead. So like, let's scrap this story game we're doing and let's just go for it and get a bare bones first person shooter out. And they said, no, no way, you should do what you're supposed to be doing. And we were going, well, that's stupid because it would be a good thing to do. And the bare bones shooter that they were talking about was, of course, the first Time Splitters game. Which, as you can tell by the way he's talking about it, was a completely slapped together proof of concept project that they wanted to slide out of the door. When you play the first Time Splitters, you can really feel that because there isn't really that much to do in it, but the skeleton of a great game was there. You had the concept of teleporting through different time zones so you can do whatever you want with the levels, and you had shooting that felt fun and impactful. This game was mainly to show Sony what Free Radical were made of and to get a shooter engine in place to work from on future projects. With Steve Ellis being the wizard he was, getting the game engine up and running in such a quick time, they felt comfortable doing something a little bit cheeky behind Eidos's back. We had the bare bones of a multiplayer shooter up very, very quickly. And what we did was we just showed it to Sony, because Sony were coming to see how we were getting on and going, you're getting on really well. And we said, well, look, we've gone done this. Thinking, that's amazing, nobody's got anything that quickly done, yeah. so we, what, what's happening? It's, well, we, we want to do a multiplayer game for launch, but IDOS won't let us. <laughs> it's a very naughty boy! I mean, I think Free Radical often... I think publishers often thought we were a bit troublesome, yeah. but we were only troublesome because we were ambitious and we wanted to do things that were successful, and we didn't want to, you know, get stalled, you know, so... Yeah. That was how we always ran the company. I just appreciate the cheeky git English energy that that whole story emanates. It's very Chad and very based. So after going maverick behind Eidos's back to the big boy Sony, they were finally allowed to make time splits. And with the first entry, the team even wanted people playing the game to have as much creative fun as they were. They were looking at PC FPS games from the time and thinking about adding in a map maker before launch. But they had to fight Eidos tooth and nail to get them to approve them adding a map maker to the game which was the start of the many times Eidos and Free Radical would butt heads throughout their torture business relationship. But we'll get more into that later with Time Splitters 2. And after all these trials and tribulations, the lads managed to get their passion project out of the door in time for the launch of the PS2. And I would say it's probably the best launch game for the PS2, with pretty good reviews. David Doak was vindicated when he said it was a good idea. I think that's enough backstory, so what is the game actually like then? That is a difficult thing to say. Now technically I've already made this video about 5 years ago on my old YouTube channel and that video was rough around the edges and full of YouTube not friendly language. Which is kinda why I wanted to make this video because I love time splitters and I knew I could make a much better video about the series. But in that video I did not really click with this game and I was maybe a little bit harsh on it in retrospect. And me remembering not having the best time with it for that video had me prepared to not like it again. Maybe that lowered my expectations a bit for this time playing it, but I ended up having a really good time with it. Sure, it has some problems that were fixed in the later entries, but this first entry is proof of concept and it has its own charms. It sort of has a more old school feel to it compared to the rest of the series, which might have something to do with the veteran rare guys being involved. And when David Doak said they wanted to get out a bare bones FPS for the launch of the PS2, they weren't joking because this is pretty much a demo for a game engine. Who's in here? No one. There's no flashy cutscenes tying the levels together, it's just a series of environments that you have to work your way through. And there's something kind of magical about that because it just feels like some creatives going loose with their imagination and having no thought for rhyme or reason. It kind of reminds me of how Miyazaki of Studio Ghibli fame works when he's trying to make a new movie. He just draws scenes and things he thinks look cool and then afterwards tries to piece together how he can make them into a film. 
It's like, for example, my neighbor Totoro. He had the classic drawing of Totoro and a young girl at the bus stop and went, how do I get there? And this is the style of creativity that the Free Radical guys managed to tap into with the whole series of Time Splitters, really. Except for here in the first game, they just created the scenes and skipped the part where it had to make any sense. From what I've seen them say in interviews, they thought they'd made some really great games of GoldenEye and Perfect Dark, but they thought they were very narrow. And you always ended up playing the same old military generic guys fighting in blocks of concrete. They wanted to give the players loads of different characters to play as in multiplayer battles and the story mode. They wanted you to have loads of different places for your death matches to take place in, and of course different weapons of different times. And this mode of thinking probably is why these games appeal to me so much, because I think more than anything I can feel it's a group of people just having fun. And as a fellow creative of some degree, I think it comes across in your art if you're enjoying yourself in what you're making. And sorry to bring up Miyazaki again, but this quote from him always sticks with me when it comes to making any kind of art. <laughs> and when it comes to this rocky start to the series, I still enjoyed myself a lot, so they obviously did something right. I think you can look past the bare bones nature of this game because the engine they set out in this game just feels so satisfying to play. It did take me a couple seconds to adjust though, because in Time Splitters 2 and 3, a lot of the time I play with the crosshairs on. But here in this game, if you have the crosshairs on, you have to aim completely unassisted, which is just asking for trouble in a console FPS. I reckon by looking back at my old gameplay footage, I might have been playing most of the game this way, which might have added to me not liking the game back then. But with that said, you do at certain times have to switch over to manual aiming when you're dealing with certain types of enemies. Don't worry, I'll have a rant about that in a minute. However, this time, after I got completely ruffle stomped a couple of times, I figured out where I was going wrong. And this is where the true enjoyment started. I like to have fun, 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 fun! Running around these varied levels with the mostly satisfying to use weapons blasting away enemies is just so awesome. It's incredibly fast and mostly about your reaction times against the computer, but it isn't all good because there is a lot of pain interspersed. And maybe I could just crack this up to my deteriorating gaming skills as an old man, but I think a lot of it has to do with this game just being as cheap as a McDonald's saver menu. And I think a lot of this comes down to the old school game design that I said this game has, because it is one difficult game. Enemies are placed in the most gotcha places imaginable all the time in darkened corners of the level or just straight up on ledges where you can't see them. Most of the time you'll be walking around going, who the hell is shooting at me only to find some git on a girder? You can tell they just randomly plonk the enemies down without much forethought if it makes any sense. And you can die so quickly in this game that if you don't know exactly where every enemy is coming from, you're buggered. Going through this arcade mode honestly made me feel like I was a speedrunner at certain points with the precision it requires out of you. You have to know exactly where the enemies are going to be coming for you from or you will stand no chance of making it through these levels. Which is what gives this game that classic SNES Mega Drive level challenge for me and there's no faking it, you have to know what you're doing. It reminded me of playing through something like Super Ghouls and Ghosts where you would be dying over and over again and learning the level as you go. Which was both a good and bad thing because it brought me back to my youth in the 1800s but it also took my anger to my primordial caveman state. One level in particular literally made me want to smash a controller because it was so frustrating. Cough, cough, the mansion. I, ha I have no strength left. Let this end or let me die. It got to that nice balance of I keep getting my ass handed to me but I want to try it again the older stuff used to give me. I got a similar feeling from beating the original Crash Bandicoot with a mate a couple of months ago. You're in physical pain, but you like it. It's mutually assured pain, which I'm sure Dark Soul fans get all too well. The way this game lays out its levels though, manages to create a level of anxiety I didn't know a game could induce in me. And this is because of two things, the fact that these levels are just laid out like absolute toss, and the way they do the end sections are genius and sadistic torture at the same time. On the first point, at the best of times in video games, I can barely figure out where I'm meant to go and I'm notorious for being awful at puzzles in games. Thankfully there's no puzzles in this game, but the way the levels are designed where everything looks the same gets me lost all the time. The main offender of this for me is actually the first level, the tomb level, which kind of makes sense, but go easy on me game, I have the navigational skills of a blind sailor with no arms and a vitamin deficiency. Lady, look at me, I don't even know where the hell I am half the time. This does lead to something I quite like about this game though, which is the way your objectives are structured for each level. Unlike something like the sequel to this game or maybe Goldeneye, the goals for each level are pretty much the same. Which kind of sucks, but you'll usually have to retrieve an item from somewhere in the level and take it to another point on the map to win. They used a similar mechanic in Time Splitters 2, with you usually having to find the time crystal in a level, but that one had other missions going on. Here the only goal is that one item, and again, like in Time Splitters 2, once you grab what you're after, the whole level will go absolutely mad and come after you. The Time Splitters themselves in this game have a completely different design, which is a little bit generic, but they're still terrifying in what they can do to you. They deal a lot of damage and spawn pretty much constantly as you're trying to make your grand escape. And I love this feeling because it makes you feel like you're at the climax of an action movie. I can't count the amount of times I've been so close to the exit on bugger all health only to be taken out by a cheap ass enemy. It's just so tense and gets the old adrenaline going, especially when you've been stuck on a level for ages that you want beaten. 
Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. Most of the levels just play like a fast-paced action movie, but there's definitely times where the game feels like it wants you to sneak about. Sneaking is actually quite an integral part of the later games. I mean, look at the first level of its direct sequel. There's a few levels that are set up like your typical infiltration mission, but the enemies just seem to always know where you're going to be no matter what you do. Sure, there's nothing wrong with going in guns blazing, which is what I usually do, but having the option and not taking it is what I want. I wish you had the choice to not sneak in later levels. Cough, cough, Neo Tokyo, I will rant about that later. But these levels are still pretty few and far between, and they're still kind of good, if not a bit bland, compared to the other more interesting areas of the game. As with its sequel, this game starts off perfectly with the tomb level that has a good mix of fast-paced action and a bit of horror with the mummies. I'm pretty sure they were inspired by the mummy movie with Brendan Fraser that was a huge hit at the time and had only just come out a year before. And you get to use a Mauser pistol in this level that shoots amazingly and is my favourite pistol of all time. It's just so sexy. This level actually introduces one of my favourite recurring characters as well, who appears in every time for this game. The over-the-top Brit, Captain Ash. Tally-ho, pip-pip, and Bernard's your uncle. And the next level actually introduces another character that will become a recurring character, Harry Tipper. But instead of being an Austin Powers-like super spy, he's actually a cop. So this must be how he got his start before becoming an international man of mystery. Now this second level is another one I absolutely love because it feels like you're playing through a John Woo movie. It's got everything those movies have, down to the Chinese restaurant theme and shooting people through windows and on top of ledges. It's just such a good time. This kind of level is where this game is at its best, just pure fast shooting with chaos going on everywhere. I'm also sure a lot of my love for this level comes from it being included as a multiplayer map in the later editions of the game as well though. A lot of the time it really does feel like these guys just watched a bunch of movies and turned them into levels. It's not all roses though, because there are a lot of these levels I do find a bit meh, like the sci-fi ones and a few of the more military based ones. Sure, they're not awful or anything, I still enjoyed them, but I just find them very forgettable unlike the two more horror based levels in this game. The first one being the village that has you going through an undead town, shooting at shambling hordes of ghouls with and without guns. Which is actually the first level I had a bit of trouble with because it's just got loads of gotcha moments. A lot of these are to do with the zombie type enemies that behave like no other enemies in the game, they're just annoying as hell. You do get a bit of this with the mummies in the first level, but it only really became a problem for me in the mansion level, which I loved and also made me want to tear my scalp off. It's only game. Why you have to be mad? So basically the mansion is this game's full on zombie level which would later become a tradition in the series. And usually to be fair those levels always ended up being my favourite but not really here. Okay it's pretty decent but I'm just being a salty female dog. The crux of my annoyance with this level is how fighting the zombies in this game works because you can't just blast away like you can in the rest of the games. Because these guys are zombies you of course have to shoot them in the head which is fine and makes sense, they're zombies. But the problem is the level of precision you need to actually hit the head in the first place and the fact that they're immortal if you miss the headshot. Which wouldn't be the worst thing in the world on its own but when you shoot them anywhere but the head they go down like they've died and then get back up again. And when you're dealing with hordes of these buggers it can get very annoying especially considering if you're even a slight pixel off it won't count as a headshot. I had so many occasions where I thought for sure it was a headshot, only for them to get back up again. Attackers can be stopped by removing the head or destroying the brain. And don't get me started on the fact that they gave the zombies guns in this level, which means you have to give them extra shots to disarm them. But I will say this for these levels, you get to use the series classic shotgun for the first time here and it's always so good to use. The slightly more wafty aiming in this game is probably to blame for these zombies being harder than they should be though. This level is just ridiculous, it's basically a long series of hard set pieces that you have to memorise or you'll die. And you'll have to know when to switch back between auto aiming and manual aiming because if you use the wrong one you can literally die in seconds. Although this level did annoy me, the love came when I was dying but slightly getting inches further every single time. This is where I got into a really hypnotic rhythm of incredible focus followed by anger at dying again and going, just one more time. And I think that gets to the heart of the beauty and simplicity of the first times for this game. It's just pure gaming in a way. It's you against the CPU and you're not going to let that damn PS2 get the better of you, are you? Well, I mean I am because I'm dumb and crap at video games. This level had me talking to myself like a crazy person to help me remember what was coming next and where the next health pack was. And you know a game has done something right when it's got you in a state of pure concentration. That's when I think I really started to finally appreciate what this entry in the series was giving me. Apart from making me question my ability at gaming. <laughs> Your powers are useless on me, you silly Billy. This was definitely the most I felt challenged by a video game in a very long time and it just felt great. The whole end section of trying to escape the mansion with the zombies and time splitters chasing me was just epic. Slowly trying to creep my way to the end because I basically nearly died at the end every single time. And that feeling of accomplishment I got when I made it to the end reminded me of why I got into gaming in the first place. This level might be a little bit unfair, but beating it won't be an experience I forget anytime soon, that's for sure. If it had been the last level in the game, I wouldn't have been surprised about how difficult it was, but it wasn't. The last level in this game is about a robot that for some reason is being shot at because he wants to get booze for his intergalactic flight. 
And if that isn't the most time splitters way to end a game, I don't know what is. Godspeed to that alcoholic robot. If you thought this story was based, you're right. They must have really just been getting into future armor for this particular level of the game. The story mode in this one isn't exactly that long or in depth, but it's really entertaining for what it is. And the fact that like in the later games you can unlock new characters from the multiplayer mode makes you want to beat everything this game has to offer. It's the reason that in the later games I put myself through the hassle of beating the whole challenge mode, which actually got its start here and it's not quite as in depth as the ones in the later games but it's there and it gives you more stuff to do. And unlocking these characters and running around shooting at people as a zombie or a Chinese chef is just part of the wild time that is time splitters. When I was going to start this video up I went back and had a look at the reviews this game was getting at the time. And I was quite surprised to see a lot of 8s and 9s remembering me not liking it that much, but coming back to it now, I kind of get it. It was a launch title for the PS2 and it probably was without a doubt the best out of the bunch if you don't count Tekken Tag Tournament that was a banger as well. I was definitely completely discounting how much of a good time you could get out of the multiplayer stuff in this game. Which just makes sense because as David Doak himself said about the game in multiple interviews... It was originally, our, our working title for it was MPG, multiplayer game. <laughs> and the last time I made a video on this series I didn't have anyone around who I could get to play the multiplayer portion of this game for the video. And I think this might have changed my opinion on it a little bit because I didn't really need to do this with the later games because I had plenty of experience with their multiplayer modes. But it just so happens as of the making of this video I had a friend living with me for a couple of weeks while he finds somewhere else to live. So I got him to play the multiplayer with me under the threat of me throwing him out on the street like the urchin he is. Now you don't have as many options as you might do in the later games but that's to be expected. However we had an absolute blast. Having the option to share the misery of the difficulty of the story mode missions with someone else just breathes new life into it. And the multiplayer deathmatches were just as great as they are in the later games and it's just frantic fun. I could have seen childhood Jake getting hundreds of hours out of this mode alone like I did with the rest of the series. Just sitting down and shooting each other in an FPS deathmatch took me back to the old days of having your friends huddled around the glow of the smallest CRT you've ever seen. Blasting each other away and barely being able to see what's going on and constantly moaning about it while annoying the hell out of each other. The team at Free Radical with this first entry ultimately did what they set out to do. They made a multiplayer game, as the codename entailed. It's a solid foundation that the construction crew of creatives they've gathered can build a beautiful house on top of. And that's certainly what they did with the rest of the series because every game just gets better and better from here out. For what it is, the first time splitters may not have aged the best, but I think it deserves a lot more credit than it gets. It's one of the first great games on a console that would go down as one of the highest selling console DVD players of all time. But more than that, it did the impossible. It was the start of a series that turned me from an FPS hater into a fan of the genre and showed me it could be more than boring brown and grey military shooters. I like knives, you know. Why? Well, they're more personal. With a gun, any fool can shoot anybody from 50 yards away, you know. Immediately after everything was wrapped up on Time Splitters, the team at Free Radical launched straight into its sequel. Knowing full well everything they wanted to improve on from the first game, this time it needed a story and more structure. And amazingly they managed to churn out this legendary game in only two years with 30 people which is absolutely insane. But this development cycle was also where more cracks in their relationship with Eidos would start to show. Because for this entry in the series, Free Radical wanted to open up their games to more than just the PlayStation 2 audience. Time Splitters was going to go multi-platform. They had no trouble getting Eidos to help with the PS2 and Xbox versions, but for some reason they were reluctant to help them get into the GameCube market which the Free Radical team saw as Eidos further stifling their success. Of course, they did eventually get the GameCube version sorted though. However, all of this stuff was adding up and would lead to what would happen with the team heading into Time Splitters Future Perfect, which we will get into later. Gotta keep the suspense, innit? Naughty, naughty. You teasing me, you naughty, naughty. <laughs> Whenever I start up Time Splitters 2 for the first time in ages, it's tradition that I have to sit on the main menu and listen to that banger of a theme tune for a couple of minutes. But I digress. Time Splitters 2 starts up with an opening cutscene with our new protagonist Vin Diesel when he was in that film Pitch Black. Good movie that. Sergeant Cortez gives us the backstory of why we're going to be quantum leaping through history and causing a ludicrous amount of butterfly effects. Basically the Time Splitters are a race of evil aliens that long for the destruction of mankind. For some reason. And they are going to get to this goal by time travelling through mankind's past to eradicate us there where we have no way of stopping them. And it's up to Cortez and his partner Corporal Hart to track them through history and collect all the time crystals to reverse what they've done. Sure, it's not exactly Shakespeare, but it gives us a reason for what we're doing, and I don't know, it just kind of works. It keeps in line with that silly B-movie vibe that the first game was hinting at, even with its lack of story. And that tongue-in-cheek nature is what made me fall in love with the series to begin with, because every other game at this time took itself so damn seriously. It was great to see a game that just wanted to have a bit of fun with some dumb sci-fi, like an FPS version of Galaxy Quest or something. Hey, don't open that! It's an alien planet! Is there air? You don't know! The Time Switters themselves have been given a bit of a facelift here as well, and I quite like the new design. They're horrifying yet goofy at the same time, and they're bloody annoying to fight when you come across them in the game too. 
David Doak does admit in interviews that the time sitters in the original game were more of an afterthought than anything. It was actually a model that they already created called the Splitter Zombie, which is how the game ended up with its name. So it's nice to see them finally being integrated into the world properly, considering, you know, they're what the series is named after. But after Cortez and Heartbreak into the space station where the Splitters are holed up, they commandeer their time machine and the game truly begins. Starting with the most iconic level in this game, and definitely the best level as well, 1990 Siberia. You can tell a lot of love and care went into this one because there's so much going on and it just throws everything awesome it can at you. Reportedly the team spent half of the development time on this level alone and it shows in the final product. But before the level actually begins you get this fully voiced and fully animated cutscene and every level has one of these setting the level up. They actually had to hire on new people just to do these scenes for them because they weren't experienced with doing cutscenes. And it's been said that these bits were some of the hardest parts of the development for them to get right. This work certainly paid off because most of these cutscenes just help reinforce that fun carefree vibe the series is going for. And I gotta think that this opening cutscene for Siberia influenced Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright when they were making Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> I mean, they even had Ed in that movie playing Time Spitters 2 in a few scenes, so they definitely played it. And after that classic scene, you get shown that when Cortez time jumps, he takes over a person's body of the time, like in Quantum Leap. According to the team, this is what their intention was for the first game, but they didn't have time to spell it out. Then begins the best level in FPS history, in my humble opinion, that is very reminiscent of the first level in Goldeneye. And I feel like this was a very conscious decision on behalf of the game makers as a signal of intent, perhaps. Straight away this level shows you the amazing leap in the gameplay department from Time Sitters 1 to 2. The graphics, shooting and game engine in the first game was good but very rough around the edges. Here everything looks slick and feels smooth as butter, especially the shooting which for me is one of the most satisfying things about the game. And instead of every level having the same old structure, these levels actually have their own set of goals and objectives. Which again is calling back to their old games Perfect Dark and Goldeneye but modernising their concepts quite a bit. Straight away the game says to you, here's a shooting playground, approach this level however you want. If you want to go in all guns blazing with no concern for sneaking, you can, or you can be a sneaky ninja who never gets seen. Sadly, it isn't like this for the rest of the game though, which we will rant about in great detail later. As a kid, I would never be caught dead sneaking about in a video game like some sort of prancing elf. But I make an exception for this level because it kind of feels amazing sneaking around headshotting people. I fear you're underestimating the sneakiness, sir. I've played through this level maybe hundreds of times and it just never gets old for me, it's a pure joy. Except for one evil thing that these game developers for some reason decided to put in this level to mess with us. At two points in this game, there's two snipers hidden away all the way at the top of the dam that shoot at you from afar. I think we all at one point didn't realise why we were randomly getting shot throughout the level. It took me ages of playing this game to finally realise it was these gits placed really out of sight that you would never notice. It almost feels like a trolley joke from Free Radical, which I think just adds to the cheeky charm of them doing this. Sure, the spy James Bond part of this level is awesome, but what makes this level the best is the second half of the level. At a certain point, zombies come into the picture with mutants as well, with secret agents trying to kill them and you. The chaos of this part is just beautiful to experience, I mean there's guys with flamethrowers everywhere. And you must have been really proud of the fire system in this engine because they show it off everywhere in this game. They even put a shower in this section in case you get set ablaze so you can put yourself out. I said that in the first game the zombies were too annoying to deal with because you needed to be too precise with them and the fact that they were immortal unless you headshotted them. But here they fixed that and the zombies from this game onward in my opinion are one of the funnest things to fight in the series. No longer do they fall down and be unhittable if you miss a headshot, now they will actually react and the headshots are way less precise. Which just results in them being so fun to blast apart, I never get sick of decapitating them in this game. Ah yes, the good old gratuitous violence that I'm completely desensitised to. Is it metal for none of you to care at all? Yeah, it's way more metal if we don't care about it. And I would be annoyed with myself if I didn't mention the fact that the guns in Time Spitters 2 just feel 10 times better than in the first game. Most of the guns actually feel different and nuanced to use, like all the different pistols actually have their own quirks. It might honestly just be a sound design thing that makes it seem this way to me because I'm easily tricked. But to me one of the best pistols to shoot in this game is the Garrett Cowboy Revolver. However that might be to do with the awesome cowboy sound it makes. And there's nothing I like better in these games than just shoot things with the Soviet or the SBP-90 machine gun. Or the returning double barreled shotgun that feels even better to wreck people with in this game. I mean there's even a crossbow which I actually hate to use but it's just cool that it's here. And this banger of a level ends with a boss battle with a freaking helicopter which just caps off this fine wine of video game entertainment. There's actually a few different set piece boss battles in this game that are sometimes massive things like this demon guy in Notre Dame. But they've also added in human boss characters that are really easy to beat once you get shooting because you can just stun lock them to death. And surely the rest of the levels have aged as well as this perfect level, right? Wrong, 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 wrong. 
Wrong, 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 wrong. Like I said earlier, the team at Free Radical almost spent half of the development time on this one level. So obviously the rest of the levels were going to suffer. But it's not like the rest of these levels in the game are awful or anything, it just feels a little bit lopsided. It's not enough for me to stop loving this game, but it's enough to annoy me greatly after the lovely picnic that is the first three levels. The Chicago level, for example, is an awesome one that smacks of the Sean Connery mobster movie Untouchables. Even if the whole section where you're transporting Marco the Rat is about as engaging as picking out your favourite carpet examples. Marco, you're being stalked by mobsters that want you dead. Could you maybe move a little bit faster, mate? And the level following that, Notre Dame, is actually one of my favourite levels in the game, probably because it's another zombie one. Any level where I'm blasting zombies' heads off with a shotgun is a 10 out of 10 in my books. Plus, this level might have one of the most ridiculous parts of the games in it, which is definitely saying something. But you know, we're in Notre Dame and all, so Free Radical thought it would be a great idea to add in a moment where you murder zombies shoulder to shoulder with the hunchback of Notre Dame. 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10, 100 out of 100, best king, best king. This honestly might be the best moment in gaming history and perfectly illustrates why this game is a masterpiece of first person shooters. Sadly, the rot starts to set in with levels like Return to Planet X, which isn't awful or anything, but it's just a bit meh and it's littered with a plague that was ravaging this era of gaming, turret sections. Who thought that these were a good idea? It certainly doesn't help that this is one of the easiest levels to get lost on because everything looks the bloody same. And it's not just this level I got lost in, the later factory level as well got me lost. Which probably says more about me than the game, I suppose. I reckon I could find a way to get lost in a perfectly straight tunnel even if I was using Google Maps. But the mid of this level pales in comparison to the next level, Neo Tokyo, which gives me PTSD. It's like I said earlier, the other levels give you the choice over whether you want to sneak about or go completely Rambo, but this one doesn't. It wants you to be the sneakiest of sneaky boys, and if you screw up even one thing, that's it. You better go back to the beginning, my sunny Jim. The start of this level just has you slowly following this hacker chick to her lair, and she moves about as fast as President Grandpa up a flight of stairs. This level completely relies on memorization, and you'll get slightly further with every attempt. But having to slowly wade through stuff you've done a million times is absolutely infuriating. Having to be patient will always defeat my undiagnosed ADHD. Hi. Anyway, I started blasting. Bah, wow. bah. Ugh, this is so damn boring. I just want to be shooting robots and zombies. Let me do that game. I mean, the rest of this level isn't too bad because they let me shoot things, but I always dread doing this level when I come back to this game. But I'll give it this. It's not all bad because there's some interesting objectives and moments in this level. Like having to use the camera systems to spy on the hacker chick to get the password to open the door. And I didn't mention it earlier, but that's another thing that's new to this entry in the series. Controlled turrets and cameras via computer terminals. It just adds another layer of that super spy feeling you get in the more sneaky levels of this game when you're trying to dodge them or disable them. However, they might have gone a bit mental with them in certain spots, like this level in particular. But this does loop into the AI-controlled enemies in this game, having a lot more character than just being obstacles in your way. If you set off a camera, all the enemies in the area will track you down and gun you down like the punk you are. And if you're not being the sneakiest of fellows, they also have alarms that they can set off to alert the other guards of your presence. Whenever I see an enemy going towards an alarm, it just sets me into panic mode as I frantically try to shoot them. It's not all good though, because my lord, these guys are still dumb as a bag of rocks sometimes. I mean, here I am, literally shooting and missing this guy's head, and he has no reaction whatsoever. I guess that's okay though, because that means they're easier to kill. That made me sound like a serial killer. I'm here in the beachside brush, where we're hunting men. Get that out of my face. We're hunting men. After the hellscape that is near Tokyo, you get to have fun again with the Wild West level, which just slaps. There's nothing better than shooting people with this pistol. It does have this one weird bit where you're supposed to push this car of explosives into this wall. And you would maybe think, right, you just shoot it and it blows up the wall freeing your friend. Well, no, that's not what you're supposed to do at all. You have to make a trail of gunpowder from this car to a crate of explosives and blow it up to light this gunpowder trail on fire, leading to the car exploding and freeing your friend. How would you figure any of this out? It's the only part of the game where you have to do anything like this and there's basically no clues. They were probably just overcomplicating matters because they wanted to show off their fancy fire physics. But this isn't the only what the hell do I do moment in the game because there's another big one on the temple level later on. You have to solve this column sliding puzzle to open a door and I forget how to do it every time I come back to this game without fail. You have to make sure all these different symbols are facing a symbol of the same type. But there's a problem, there's no way of you figuring this out other than dumb luck because they don't even give you a clever clue or anything. Please stop being annoying, Time Spitters 2, I'm just trying to unconditionally love you. Goodbye. And talking of annoying, there ain't no way in hell I would make this video and not rant about Atom Smasher. Now don't get me wrong, it's amazing that they turned Harry Tipper into a hippie James Bond Austin Powers guy, but this level is just horrible. You have to quickly rush through Kalos' lair, defusing bombs on a time limit or you die. Which doesn't sound the worst, but getting to them all in time can be a constant pain in the arse. They get cute with the obstacles to stop you from progressing, like you having to use these fire extinguishers to put out fires to open doors. And the fire extinguishers are so annoying to use, and half the time you get so close that the fire actually hurts you. 
Also, again, they're just adding in fire-based stuff to show off the fire system. We get it, you discovered video game fire, it's a revelation. But the main problem with this level is the amount of dying you'll do because it's so hard to keep up enough health to actually get through the level and do the fight with Kalos at the end. Having enough health is a constant problem in this game because you can only find armor in the levels. So if you take any damage before the armor shows up in the levels, you're going to be stuck like that to the end. Which often does create these great moments at the end when you're on the brink of death just about making it to the time portal. That was pure luck! I was not in control of that situation at all! <laughs> At least in the temple level, the fire stuff is actually kind of cool with you lighting crossbow rounds on fire to kill certain enemies. There's nothing more satisfying than setting these tree golems on fire and then seeing them run away in pain. This level does have another slightly annoying thing in it though, because this part with the stone golems can bugger off. You have to lure these big gits into a pit by hitting buttons to release a trapdoor and it's not fun, it's just a pain. I mean, you can try and get the monkeys that shoot explosive melons to maybe kill them by chance. And yeah, that's a thing, monkeys with exploding melons. And the ones at the end of the level threw me for a loop until I realised you can actually kill them with a grenade launcher that's hidden at one side of the room. More troll behaviour from these bloody scallywag devs. But this level gets a pass from me based purely on its Indiana Jones vibes and the fact it went all in with the set piece moments. I've always enjoyed this part where you have to systematically take out these moving statue heads that shoot lasers at you on a rickety bridge. And hell I mean they even have the balls to actually straight up drop a boulder on you like good old Indy. Oh yeah, my boy Captain Ash makes a return here and gets fleshed out a bit more with his little cutscene intro. I love that they chuck in every old school English slang word that they could like Toodly Pip and Tally Who! You just gotta love him going to foreign countries and stealing their artifacts and acting like he owns them, which is as English as cricket on a village green. Based. However, the robot factor here takes the biscuit in terms of being annoying because this level is just obtuse as all hell. Half the time you never know where you're going and the enemies are beefy as hell which makes for a challenging time. It doesn't matter how many times I play this game, I always forget what you have to do when you get to this section of the level. You're meant to take control of this camera gumbot and shoot out the four legs of this control node thing. The only problem is that nothing tells you this and what you have to shoot at isn't obvious in the slightest. And don't get me started on these turret walker things that I feel like can only be taken out by a plasma grenade or an act of god. I had one occasion where I'd run out of grenades and I swear there was actually no way of me winning in this situation. I'm coming to kill you! At least the end boss of this level is easy because the rest sure doesn't ever stop with his unrelenting beatings. But the last level definitely continues the beatings, because this level is a git as well, however, this is to be expected, it's the last level after all. This is the level when you finally take back control of Cortez and you have to start a self-destruct sequence and get the hell out of Dodge. Which is harder than it sounds because the space station is crawling with loads of different types of time spurs. And even scarier than that, there's another forced turret sequence in here as well to slow you down. What makes this level so hard is the fact that you have to do everything on a very short time limit. And like a lot of the other levels in this game, you'll have to redo it a couple of times before you get it because there's loads of gotcha moments. Like the fact if you don't pick up a spacesuit on the other side of a certain floor before the turret section, you can suffocate to death. Okay, I appreciate the level of trolling there, but this game has been absolutely breaking my balls of all this cheap nonsense. You can't keep getting away with it! They knew what they were doing when they made this level because there's stuff like this throughout it. Like the fact that near the end of the level, there's a ludicrously long elevator ride that just burns up loads of your precious time. But the weird thing is that you just get on the ship and that's the game done and it feels very anticlimactic. I definitely thought there would have been some big boss battle with a boss time splitter or something. And that's it for the story mode of Time Splitters 2. While it isn't perfect, it's still a great time. The levels that don't annoy me are an absolute blast to play through and even the levels I don't like have redeeming features. It does feel somewhat rushed in places like some of the more slap together levels or the end that feels a little bit lopsided. But you just can't beat how good it feels to play Time Splitters 2. The shooting feels so damn satisfying. And most of the time I was playing this game, I had a giant nostalgic smile on my face like the big dumb idiot that I am. I also went back and played some of the missions in co-op with a friend like I did with the first one. And this really reminded me of how Time Spitters 2 should be played and how I played it most of the time back in the day. The little blemishes and annoyances are things you can work together to overcome and moan about together. Although as a kid I spent a lot of time playing Halo with friends, I think I spent maybe double that time playing deathmatches in Time Spitters 2. Even though Time Spitters 2 has made more of an attempt to be a more single player focused game, deep down at its heart it's still just a multiplayer FPS. But not gonna lie, I did really play a lot of deathmatches alone while listening to issues by Korn. Okay, let's go. But all of this doesn't mean that they didn't improve the hell out of the single player content that isn't the story mode. They added in arcade league modes that turns the deathmatches into a single player challenge series. Which is perfect for modern day me who's a complete loner misanthrope with no friends or people that care about him. It takes you through all the new modes they've added in for the multiplayer matches and some of these are pretty fun. But to be honest, most of the time we'd usually just stick with your standard death matches and team death matches. Most of these modes are just there for what feels like the sake of it, but Virus can be pretty interesting. It's basically a set everyone on fire tag game and it can get really entertaining when you're playing it with a group of people. It can get really nervy when you're trying to evade loads of the infected and genuinely makes me get all jumpy. 
Challengers also make a return here and they've had a bit of a revamp with more interesting things added in. And I swear some of these I'll never get out to do, like the window smashing ones where you just have to be a god. But my favourite one was already in the old game, the Surviving Waves of Zombies minigame. It was basically Call of Duty mid-century Germans before that even existed and it gives me more of a reason to headshot zombies so I can't complain. I remember spending a lot of time as a kid trying to beat all the extra stuff in this game because they all unlock more levels and characters. And child me wanted to do this more than anything because I wanted more monsters and weirdos to play as in the death matches. I actually remember having an issue of Cube magazine which had a guide on how to beat all the various challenges and what characters it would get you. I'm not 100% it was that magazine but I think so. I have no clue what the heck. Bleep is going on here. So as an overall package, Time Spitters 2 is absolutely amazing, warts and all, and earns its place as one of the best FPS games of all time. While not every level is a banger, the ones that are good are pure 10 out of 10s in my book, and the ones that aren't good are still very memorable. Now this might be an unpopular opinion, but I think the series really came together and perfected the Time Spitters formula with the last one we have to talk about in this video. As I alluded to at the start of the Time Spitters 2 section of this video, after the release of Time Spitters 2, Free Radical and IDOS were having problems. Free Radical were the kind of studio that was always going to be aiming higher with every single release. And IDOS didn't quite fit this ethos, because while Time Spitters 2 was a great success, the boys at Free Radical felt like it could have been a much bigger success. Because Time Spitters 2 was critically acclaimed and sold a decent amount of copies, of course a bunch of publishers were going to come a knocking. And some would argue there was no bigger game publisher at the time than EA who came a-courting the lads at Free Radical. They felt like with a bigger budget and better people marketing their game, they could make Time Spitters an even bigger franchise than it already was. But of course, as always happens when EA gets involved in a company, they're going to have stupid demands that they think will make a game successful. They still do this now and they did it back then. They just look around at the gaming landscape and try to fit whatever they've got into that mould. I can't even count the amount of truly amazing studios that EA has chewed up and spit out like the hungriest of hungry hippos. I think me hating EA was cemented by them destroying my favourite childhood English games developer, Bullfrog. EA Sports. It's up your ass. Sure, EA come in with money in their hands ready to throw at you, but behind their backs they're holding a knife. And while EA didn't quite kill Free Radical like they did many companies I love, they certainly, um, EA'd up Time Splitter's Future Perfect. Now what I mean by this is they tried to take out all of the characters that Time Splitter's had to try and make it another bland grey FPS. They were trying to get their very own Call of Duty or Halo type success and you can really feel that in this finished project. According to David Doak, they wanted to make Time Splitter's more serious which would completely ruin what made it good in the first place. Apparently they went so far as to send people out to Free Radical with mood boards for levels and scenes in the game. The boys were not amused by this corporate office class nonsense. These lads were true creatives that just wanted to make their quirky sci-fi comedy shooter but despite EA's meddling they still turned out a classic. I'm glad this game went through the meat grinder of a big publisher and still managed to come out mostly intact. I think the only big thing that EA really changed with this game was the much more muted and gritty tone to try and match your Medal of Honours or your Call of Duties. From interviews I've seen with a lot of the team, they seem to like this game but not love it quite as much as Time Spitters 2. Which is completely understandable, I'm sure the interference from EA helped colour their feelings on this game. And the fact that in many ways this game helped lead to their downfall, because as good as this game is, it wasn't the massive success they were hoping for. Sadly then leading to them to try and go fully down the modern shooter route, making the massive flop that was Haze. They had every intention of continuing the Time Spitters series, but they never got the chance because of that failure. And I'm never going to feel good about this group of talented people never getting to make another magnum opus. I am so exquisitely empty. But anyway, enough immiserating, let's actually talk about this game and how much arse it kicks and how amazing it is. Time Spitters Future Perfect starts with a cutscene where we hear a new character, Anya, explain to us the backstory of this game. And even right off the bat, you can already tell this game is a lot more cinematic than what Time Spitters 2 could accomplish. EA's involvement might not have been for the better overall, but I think them forcing the team to make it look more like a movie was a good move. You can tell EA went to Free Radical and said, Can you guys, like, you know, make it a bit more like Halo, please? The story and cutscenes in this one are just a real jump up from the past entries in terms of animation and the humour. It really makes me feel like I'm playing an early 2000s sci-fi comedy or something, and it's just perfect. And while we're talking about the look and feel, I just want to say, damn, this is a good looker for its time. It could almost pass for a 360 or PS3 game at points, and I think it's mainly due to the fact that Free Radical just has this really strong sense of art style. Games that aren't going for ultra-realism always tend to age a lot better in my books, which is why I tend to always prefer games like this. We also get to see in this cutscene that the Time Spitters have been given a bit of a face look again, looking more like the Flesh Spitter model versions from the first game. I mean, I kind of preferred their creepy grey alien looking vibe in the second entry, but they're not horrible here or anything. Cortez is on his way to deliver the Time Crystals to the human's base, which he does with about as much care as your standard mailman. Okay, Mr. Mail Carrier, we have a fresh package here, ready for shipment to our lovely customer. You got it, boss! Look at me. <laughs> he crashes down to Earth and is met by some Earth troopers that are going to be helping him throughout the mission. 
And again, this is very similar to Halo, not saying it's a bad thing or anything, but there's definitely some similarities. And the first thing you notice when you actually start to play Time Splits Future Perfect is how phenomenal the shooting feels in this entry. Obviously in the other games it felt really good as well, but in this one they've just perfected it. It's one of those games where gameplay is king because it just feels so good to play this game and I never get sick of how satisfying it is to shoot stuff. But the similarities to Halo don't end with them just adding in Marines, they've also added in a punch button. While I don't hate this, I don't think it really adds anything to the game and I honestly forgot about it and barely ever used it. I do feel like they've made the new Time Splitters enemies extra annoying though because I don't remember having this much trouble with the grey ones in 2. And they can't even help themselves by adding in more turret sections nonsense like the second game. Can't blame EA for that one I suppose. Once Cortez makes it to the base, we get a glimpse of another version of Cortez that's hinting at the later story. Then we meet the Colonel, who tasks us with going through time again to figure out the origin behind the time splits. We also get introduced to the woman that's going to be our omnipotent radio boffin and Cortez's love interest for later. She's a big swing. Arry, 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 arry. With the introductions out of the way, that's the setup for the whole game and all things considered, I really like what they've done with it. In the first proper level of the game, we are joined by my favourite character, the absolute legend that is Captain Ash. And instead of taking over a person in history's body like in Time Splitters 2, Cortez now actually just goes back in time himself. Which I like a lot better than the possessions because it gives the opportunity for Cortez to interact with these awesome characters Free Radical have created. It also gives us more time to actually get to know what Cortez's personality is like because in the second entry he was just kind of there. Here we actually get to see what he's really like and he comes off as a macho action man that can get things done but he also has a funny side. There's a lot of moments in the game where Cortez has made me chuckle and it makes him such an endearing character. Completely different to all the cookie cutter FPS protagonists we were getting at the time in gaming. Even though the budget went up and there was meddling with the production, Free Radical managed to keep that English sense of humour and charm intact. Cortez and Anya as a comedy duo throughout the game is one of my favourite parts of the game, honestly. She plays the straight man to Cortez's goofiness and it may feel a little forced that they get together at the end, but it does kind of make sense. You can hear how much she likes Cortez in her voice when she's impressed when he beat a tank on foot or a giant mech. Them constantly bullying each other is so cute and just reminds me of when I used to have love in my life. My favourite Cortez moments in the game have to be the running joke of him trying to get people to like his catchphrase. Yeah, it's time to split. Right, whatever. Time to split. Ouch, that's not cool, man. Hey, spaceman, wanna go to a party? Ken, it's time to split. Uh, just do the thing. It's time to split. I gotta go. But... Do you know who my favourite chef is? No. You. Yeah. But in turn, Cortez actually being there with different people in time leads you to getting to know the extra characters more as well. It makes the game feel less like a set of levels you have to complete objectives in and more like a journey you're going on. It makes this game feel a lot more modern than the other games in the series, which felt a lot more like better looking N64 games. It makes this game in many ways absolutely timeless. I've shown this game to many different age relatives and they all had a blast with this game. This modern approach also goes to the level design as well because it feels a lot more free-flowing and less constrained than before. It has a set-piece to set-piece moment feel to it and the fun barely ever lets up when you're playing this game. It's like a dumb action movie style game. Unlike the older games, there isn't a single level that I dread playing like some of the levels in the earlier entries. Adding to this more narrative feeling is the fact that throughout the levels you actually have an AI controlled companion who's with you for most of the action. And usually when games implement stuff like this it can be really annoying because the AI will just get in your way. But here they just did it so damn well and it incorporates their stories into the levels to wrap them into it. Like the first level where you're trying to help Captain Ash save his better half from the clutches of the villains. It does lead to some of the more annoying parts of the game though like when you have to protect Harry Tipper from getting murdered with a sniper rifle. This could be more of a me problem though because I'm an absolutely terrible shot and I should feel bad. But this moment does lead to one of my favourite moments in the game where Harry Tipper slips into a certain disguise. <sighs> it's just not my colour at all. Man, the things I do to save the world. <laughs> it's pretty breezy too. Hey, got any spare socks? I, I need some padding. Yes, queen! Slay! Slay! Slay your enemies! Honestly, I don't think I can think of any companions in this entry that aren't extremely entertaining. Like probably my favourite Job F. Casey who is just a great sidekick for Cortez and Anya to bounce off of. And you know I played this game at just the right time to help me with my love of big titty goth waifus. The way Anya jealously jabs at her throughout the levels is just priceless and ramps up that horror comedy feel. But to be fair she has her sections like Tipper where you have to protect her from zombies which can be a bit annoying at times. And I definitely have to mention the R1 robot you get to reprogram late in the game. He has this kind of Gromit from Wallace and Gromit like relationship with Cortez at first and it's just adorable. But it really takes a turn at the robot factory where he gets infected with a virus and becomes a walking one line factory. 
R1 is just the best boy and another example of that tongue-in-cheek charm that this game has about it. And the only other companion I haven't mentioned is Amy Chen and she's a little bit more understated than the other characters but she still has her moments. Like for example the elevator scene between her and Cortez always puts a smile on my face and has the best time to split moment for sure. Yeah! Time to split! I'll get the next one. The AI control partners are a great addition but they also come at a detriment to the co-op in this entry. Because in many ways the levels are designed around the interactions with these various characters. And when you do the co-op you miss out on all of this because they literally just cut it from this mode. Which can make the co-op feel a little bit hollow but it doesn't stop it from being fun or anything. However there are some more oddities to the co-op as well because they have this weird feature where you teleport to each other at certain points. And this led to me and the person I was playing the game with getting very turned around and confused at points. But it isn't just the companions that Cortez is interacting with throughout his journey, he's also playing with himself quite a lot. Oh my! It starts off pretty simple with future Cortez giving Cortez a key he needed to get through a locked door. And it gets crazy by the end with multiple Cortezes teaming up to take on enemies and puzzles. I love that our Cortez and presumably the same future Cortez gain a bit of a relationship throughout the course of the game. And in many ways our Cortez develops that same relationship with his past self as well. It's cool that we get to see these cutscenes twice from two different perspectives at certain times in the game. Cortez just loves his turn to be the cool Cortez in the know that can help the in the dark past Cortez. There's also gameplay sections where you get to play as both sides of a Cortez inception interaction. Like on the train level where you have to protect your future self from guards while he takes out a helicopter for you. And then you have to go and become that same future Cortez taking down the helicopter while the past one protects you. One of these sections is actually one of my least favourite parts of the whole game though because they go a bit mad with it in a long fighting puzzle section. You have to try and solve a bunch of sliding tile puzzles to open a door with multiple Cortezes helping. And I'll let you know that I'm glad in this game they called it with the annoying puzzles but I feel like they saved it all for this bit. These puzzles just piss me off especially when you're trying to do them on a timer with the threat of redoing them looming over you. That's right, if you fail this you have to start all over again and do long shooting sections that are interspersed between the puzzles. I obviously love this part from a thematic point of view of all the time travel nonsense but it can go bugger off. Phil you make me angry Phil! I will admit after trying this a bunch of times I had to go look up how to do it on YouTube because if I didn't this video would have took another month. But something that didn't annoy me in this game is the main villains of our piece, Jacob Crow and Kalos. While Kalos is more of a little footnote side villain but him being included as a part of the story is a winner in my books. And actually having a tangible villain to face off against in this game gives it a bit more focus than the intangible seeming force of the time splitters in 1 and 2. I like the way in Future Perfect that Crow is sort of slowly revealed as the main enemy. You see him multiple times without knowing who he is. It keeps the mystery and intrigue going the first time you play the game and it has you intrigued. Because at the start of the game you and Cortez don't really know what you're coming up against or what you're really looking for. They're just sort of investigating a bunch of areas where the time crystals have been used hoping to find some clues on the time splitters themselves. It starts in the second level of the game where you enter his boardroom and get a glimpse of him as he escapes. And then later you bump into him briefly as he's scheming away at his evil plans. Which does lead to one of my favourite Cortez and Anya moments. Would this help? Hmm. Well, if I took a scan of the photo, I could identify the surrounding landscape with our topographical database. Then, if I triangulated the distances and heights of the buildings, then cross-referenced that data with the architectural styles, I might be able to deduce some probable locations. How about Stanislav Train Depot, September 4th, 1969? What? It's on the back of the photo. After that, they follow him to the 60s, where they find him teaming up with the amazingly campy Bond villain that is Kalos. Who Crow is of course using so he can take away his manpower to help bolster his cult of the Brotherhood of Ultra Science. And you find out in the next level that he actually started this cult in the 90s on the Mansion of Madness level. It was started with the intention of being a collective of scientists striving towards the goal of eternal life. But obviously Crow was just lying to everyone so he could of course use the research for himself and no one else. Their endeavours in the 90s just ended up creating undead demons and zombies which of course was not their intention. And when Cortez comes to town this whole first incarnation of the Brotherhood obviously comes crashing down. This is when the crow we've been chasing first comes into contact with his younger self and gives him what he needs to further his goal of eternal life. Which does lead to this pretty funny scene with the two of them. Get us out of here! <laughs> See you in the future, sucker! <laughs> the red button. No, no, no. Uh, the one on the side. Yeah, that one. <laughs> You see that scene kind of sums up why I like Crow as a villain, he's obviously a nutter but he's still funny. Which just complements the tone of this game perfectly and I love how you kind of just see him sliding further and further into mad villainy. Following this they find Crow again who has turned his cult into a corporation instead. Basically the same thing anyway. 
and again he's tried getting immortal life but has buggered it up and ended up creating unholy abominations. He's not very good at this is he? I do kind of wish they made it seem like Crow had some noble intentions at first to make him more relatable instead of just being full on evil. But it fits the tone of the game more I guess for him to just be a bad guy for our jacked up space marine to take out. But then the younger Crow ends up further in the future where he rips off Terminator with Ultranet. And the end of his arc in this game has him using his robotics company to turn himself into this half man half machine abomination. Which as the last boss is actually really cool and it's just your classic monkey paw wish type situation. Because sure, in this form he's got what he wanted, but at what cost? He's just a lump of flesh and robotics. It's not the most in-depth story ever, but it works for this type of game that doesn't really take itself too seriously. The way it approaches the sci-fi genre in many ways reminds me of the greats of doing parody, like Monty Python and the Carry On films. Which again just harkens back to the fact that this game was made by an English team, even though EA tried to knock this character out of the game. In many ways, this game is just a perfect parody video game because it does everything so well you don't even notice you're basically playing a spoof game. If I was going to give this a rating on a scale of great sci-fi parodies, I think I would give it a space balls out of 10. How many assholes we got on this ship anyhow? Go! But I think what makes this story enjoyable and maybe feel better than it deserves any credit for is the way they've weaved the levels around it. In the first two games, everything felt completely random and both of the games felt like an excuse to just lampoon a bunch of different genres the developers liked. But here everything feels like a lot more cohesive as an overall package, nothing ever really feels like it jumps the shark. I mean, I don't think I would have been against them jumping the shark, I mean, some of those are my favourite moments in the series. I think that keeping everything a little bit more grounded works for the game overall and makes the fun parts work even more. And unlike the other games in the series, there isn't any level that I feel like is badly designed or annoying. There's no levels in this game that I absolutely dread coming up against like Atom Smasher or Neo Tokyo in number 2. I mean, other than that one puzzle section with multiple Cortezes, I don't think there's anything that really annoys me. This game is just a pure joy front to back, which is probably why I always come back to play this game at least once a year. There just isn't a bad level in this game, and even the levels I don't like as much are still incredibly good. There's not many games that can legitimately keep a smile on my dumb face as long as this game can. Some people might say that this game is a little bit short when compared to other games, clocking in at 6 or so hours. But to be honest with you, the other games in the series aren't that much longer and the extra time comes from you getting stuck on irritating bits anyway. Here for me it's quality over quantity, it's just a perfect single player FPS experience for me. Okay I'd be lying if I said everything they added in was for the better because there's some really odd vehicle sections. And I hate to bring up Halo again, but I feel like EA wanted these in here because, you know, they had the Warthog in Halo. This was another weird trend in video games around the time because every game just apparently needed a vehicle section. I mean, they even put driving sections into games like Tony Hawk's around this time, so I guess it's no surprise it ended up here as well. The driving section in the Ultranet level, for example, has always felt a bit tacked on and pointless to me. Mainly because like the other driving sections, it just controls like absolute bunkum and almost feels as bad as the Mako in Mass Effect 1. But I can't stay mad at this for too long because these sections are pretty damn far apart and they let you pilot a giant mech at certain points as well. Oh, oh darn, that's awesome! That's really awesome! Another thing that kind of feels unnecessary but doesn't bother me all that much is the inclusion of the magic psychic glove thing. It feels a bit pointless and you just use it to pick up stuff and hit switches that are too far away for you to reach. I much preferred the temporal uplink from the second game, however it doesn't really matter that much. It does have its moments though, like this part on the train level where you have to use it to get out of a super villain poison trap. While Future Perfect doesn't cover as many genres as the past games, it's what it does in these levels that makes them so good. Everything feels a lot more fleshed out. So fleshed out in fact that even on levels where sneaking is basically required, I still love it. Which is no small feat, I assure you. And I think this is in no small part due to the fact that even on the more stealthy levels you can still brute force your way through if you want to. There's no Neo Tokyo type level where you completely fail if you get caught and have to go back to the beginning. Even though in many ways this entry feels a lot more linear in a gameplay sense, it feels a lot more free. Like on the whole Kalos set of levels that you do with Harry Tipper where it's implied that you should sneak but you don't have to. And Harry even comments on it if you fail at being sneaky which I of course do every time I play this level. This level succeeds at accomplishing the feel a lot of the levels from the older titles were going for with the proper James Bond feeling. Everything about this level is fun down to stealing disguises and getting to walk among the guards and hear them gossip. Which leads to one of my favourite sections in the whole game, the train level that just feels like a love letter to their old game Goldeneye. I don't know why, but the feeling of gunning down people on the train is just so satisfying, especially when you're up on the roof of the train. And Kalos in this level is on fine form, absolutely camping it up and doing puns upon puns, which has me rolling my eyes and smiling simultaneously. Ah yes, I can only assume you refer to your darling Kitten Celeste. I'm afraid she's a little tied up at the moment. Oh, don't fret, I have a feeling we'll be running into her shortly. <laughs> but first, it's time to get out my big weapon. He's 
pulling his cock out. The boss fight on top of the train with Kalos on a jetpack is just so awesome and a great way for this banger of a level to end. The boss battles in this one are definitely a step above the ones in Time Spitters 2. In 2, a lot of them just felt like a dude with a gun with a few interesting ones peppered in. But here, pretty much all of the boss fights are awesome, like the first one where you have Cortez fighting a tank. Instead of them being straightforward affairs, you do actually have to figure out how to beat them sometimes. Like with a tank where you have to use explosive rounds on your SMG and go put dynamite on the back of it. Or the fights against the various forms of Crow, like the giant slug mech where you have to shoot certain parts of him. I always found it funny that in this section he goes around dropping bombs like he was Bomberman or something. And unlike the second game which ends unceremoniously, you actually get a final proper boss fight with a slimmed down Mecha Crow. But my favourite ones have to be in my favourite set of levels in the game, the zombie levels. These two levels without a doubt might be the best undead levels in the series and that's saying a lot because I love the Siberian Dam. The inclusion of a wisecracking cute goth girl probably does elevate this level to an 11 out of 10. You're no zombie! Yeah! Oh, <clears throat> yeah. Tranquility. Perfection. I do feel like they made the zombies a little bit less easy to headshot in this one though, because it feels like you have to be very precise like the first game. But that doesn't stop this from being a banger with the best boss in the game, the princess, this hulking mass of flesh. That's fed and kept alive by a scientist who's gone mad and looks suspiciously like Ozzy Osbourne. You fight the princess twice, once in a courtyard and a second time in the pit of hell to save the goth waifu. And this fight is kind of annoying because you have to do this on a time limit of Joe Beth not getting murdered. And the sound she makes when she gets killed is honestly horrifying and blood curdling. Good job to that voice actress. And it's another fight where you have to work out to shoot the canister in its mouth and the annoyance aside it's just epic. And don't get me started on the second half of this level with the underground lab that just gives me vibes of Day of the Dead. There's also a section where you get to do some ghost busting on this level which is pretty awesome if not a bit fiddly. The eugenics level actually kind of has a similar vibe to that level in many ways and it's a callback to the Siberian Dam from the second game. The level is definitely up there with my favourite levels in this game. Which is strange because it's a stealth level. Well the first section of it is anyway, it brings back that feel of Time Spitters 2 with you having to dodge cameras and whatnot. But it's the second half of this level that I really love because it goes into that more super spy territory of you infiltrating a secret lab and grabbing key cards and stuff. Ultimately leading to a mutant outbreak where you have to kill them all with special blow darts that blow them up into a pile of viscera. Blood for the blood god! What it boils down to for me is Time Spit is Future Perfect is the ultimate form of this series. And while it certainly does have its problems, it's always a really fun game to replay like it was a silly sci-fi movie. The plot doesn't have to make perfect sense, it's just a vehicle to have some laughs and have some fun shooting stuff real good. The ending is perfect in many ways because it's cheesy, it's silly, but it's Time Spitters. Cortez defeats the bad guy and gets the girl. It feels a lot more concrete than the slapdash ending to the last game and makes me feel like one of my favourite FPS series of all time went out with a bang and not a whimper. And then there's a Cortez disco dance party for the credits which is extremely on brand and I love it. Impressive. Very based. But a time this game always comes alive in the multiplayer modes and single player challenge modes and Future Perfect is no different. Although the co-op is a bit of a letdown, like 2 I played this game mostly in split screen multiplayer with my friends. And I think what made this one of my favourites was the sheer number and variety of things you can play as in the death matches. Me and my friend Chris were playing this for this video and we had a hard time picking our characters because there was so much cool stuff to play as. And nothing brings back the nostalgia quite like blasting each other away in the deathmatch arenas of this game. The fact that they brought back so many characters and levels from the old games is a massive plus as well. Because I never get sick of playing on the Mexican mission level for whatever reason. God this is the best one. We even did some of the arcade league and challenge mode levels handing the controller off and trying to beat them. Which was a pretty common thing to do while playing these kind of games back in the day. But damn did they make all these challenges a lot harder in this one. We were having actual trouble with these ones. Or maybe we're just getting old and bad at video games. You're getting fed this line about how, like, you're gonna live forever or whatever, you're gonna die. In my opinion, Time Spitter's Future Perfect puts a lovely bow on this absolute unit of a series. If talking about these games for over an hour wasn't proof of how much I love these games, I don't know what is. Well, maybe the fact that this is actually the third video I've done on this series since I've been making content on YouTube. The first video game review I ever did was in 2010 on my old channel and it was on Time Spitters 2. And that video was quite frankly awful, unscripted and had me on camera with my giant afro that I had back in my childhood bedroom. It goes to show that even that far back I held this series in such a high esteem to make it my first ever video. Like I said earlier, in May of 2018, I actually even practically made this video I'm writing now, just in the style I was doing at the time. Now while this video is a lot better than my first one on the subject, the script is awful and there was loads of on-camera skits that weren't that funny. Not to mention that this was back when I made videos on a two-week time frame, so I completely rushed it out to meet my imaginary deadline. 
And because of that, the editing in this one is just so sloppy and badly done, which is why I wanted to revisit it for this channel. That video still gets loads of views and it may be annoyed that I hadn't done a better job on a game I love so much. Which is why I made this third video on Time Splitters that was just an hour long love letter to one of my favourite game series of all time. And honestly I'll take any excuse I can get to play through this amazing series again, it's just a pure joy. It's crazy to me that in all the time since I made that second video, basically no one has made their own series retrospective. Well there is some, but they aren't quite as in depth as this one. It does make me feel like Time Splitters is probably the most underrated FPS series out there. It's like some cult band that only really cool people know about or care about, and if you're watching this video you're probably in that group. So as we wind down, I want to hear your experiences with the series down below and let's get all nostalgic about this glorious set of games. Time Splitters has a place in my heart for many reasons, it's connected to childhood friends and multiple content creating portions of my life. It's something I'll never get sick of and I'm sure will fill me full of nostalgic joy until I'm an old man playing it in a diaper at a care home. Thank you for watching this incredibly long love letter, I've been a goblin and thank you for watching. If you would like to get all my videos months early and to get your name in the credits, consider supporting me on Patreon, links in the description.